Uh, welcome back to the channel again, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all so much for coming over. We're back on the Art of Dialogue channel. Boy, Judge Joe Brown, he's been talking, haven't he? Judge Joe Brown exposing, exposes the shocking truth about who killed Martin Luther King Jr. Hey, I'll leave the link to their channel in the description so you guys can check out more and even subscribe. We ain't gonna waste no more time. Let's jump right into it. I gotta ask you about Martin Luther King. You know who was behind his murder, right? If I'm not mistaken. Okay, he was assassinated by a two-man hit team from the fire station. Not from the flop house, not from the bushes, which were right below the window for the flop house. Flop house window never opened far enough to shoot a rifle out of it. The bushes weren't the place. Uh, the reason people think it was coming from that location was the echo off of the front of the Lorraine Motel. The weapon was an M14 converted to an M21. It was an experimental uh, project. They made 62 of them with an extra barrel. Uh, they put a Redfield 3-9 to nine power scope modified by a company known as Leatherwood on it. And they had a suppressor, which caused the sound to be modified. Man. They shot subsonic ammunition, which is why they took a head shot instead of a chest shot, which would have been the usual course and the shooters were most probably recruited from the marine sniper school at quantico virginia which was just across the tarmac from an fbi training academy what? so they were supplied with five well the fbi was supplied with five xm21s by invoice serial numbers of which i man the way this man just talking with his hand on his head it's like all this information in there it's like he's tapping on his brain to remember. Yo, how do you just say all this? I, I'm just talking about like, you know, when people speak and a lot of times you people may not believe them and be like, how does he know? I'm just we're, like, all this information, man. Have secreted around the place and 5,000 rounds of the ammunition that matched the characteristics of what they pulled out of King's body. That was in late December 1967. King was shot at the beginning of April 1968. The Justice Department ordered the FBI to return the five weapons to the Defense Department so they could use them in the NOM. The FBI claimed they lost one of them. I know what the serial number is of the lost weapon. That's the murder weapon. The rifle that James Earl Ray had, which was the only thing that hooked him up to the case, since he never confessed, unlike what the media says, uh, the rate of rifling twist in his rifle was very inconsistent with what they pulled out of King's body. And the rate of rifling twist of what they pulled out of King's body would have required a gunsmith to make up a special barrel, but the Army marksmanship unit, which also supplied the Marine Corps at the time, had made up 63 of these barrels that precisely matched the ballistic characteristics of what fired the bullet that killed King. They no. took a head shot because the velocity of the bullet had been reduced to be subsonic, so the bullet arrived there after the sound instead of the bullet exceeding the speed of sound and getting there first, which is what it is, but that reduced the energy of the bullet instead of a 162 grain bullet moving at 2,700 feet per second, which has about 2,500 foot pounds of energy. You have that same 162 grain bullet moving at 1,100 feet per second, which makes it a pistol bullet with about 380 foot pounds of energy. So instead of shooting him with a solid torso shot, at about 45 yards, which would have been non-survivable with a 30 caliber rifle at that range with soft point ammo. They took a head shot and they almost missed. They hit him in the cheek and took out his upper right molars, ripped his tongue off, 
came out between his jaws, leaving the body. If that was it, he would have survived it, but wouldn't have been able to talk too well. It hit his clavicle, deflected along the clavicle under this tough uh, neck skin, went over his shoulder and down across the back, which is not unusual with a rifle bullet. Oftentimes, the victim has a bullet hole here and one straight out back. You think the bullet went straight through him. It deflected around his rib cage, came out the back. No. So what wound up happening is when it went back in, it wrecked the carotid artery complex on the right. He bled out in about 15, 20 seconds up there on the balcony. Since the wound basically was internal, the blood went inside and didn't spew all over the place. So he didn't die. Man, I ain't never heard this before. Like, the dude, the guy asked one question, and he just took off. Hospital, he didn't make it off the balcony. Now, uh, for those who are interested, Jesse Jackson is not the culprit. I advised Jesse Jackson of what I had learned. And he said, we got to get to the bottom of it. Anything I can do, uh, let me know. I talked to Reverend Lowry about it. He said, we need to get to the bottom of it. Anything I can do, let me know. I had told another person who was suspect, he said, we need to let the sleeping dog lie, sleeping dogs lie. And there's another now deceased reverend that uh, Dick Gregory interviewed, and he said, we need to let sleeping dogs lie. And Dick Gregory interviewed him a few months before he died. And Gregory and I talked about it on the phone, and this person was asked by Dick Gregory, why did you duck back in the motel after you had escorted Dr. King out onto the balcony. He said, I didn't want to get shot. That was the recordation. He said, well, how do you know you were in danger of getting shot? Well, well, uh, uh, I just figured under the circumstances. That person had a problem that Hoover knew about. Who? And Hoover had ordered all audio and visual surveillance of King to be cut off 48 hours before the event in question. And that's who brought him from the east side of the motel, or at least going down to the east side where he was going to leave, back to where he got shot, telling him that some fans of his were outside and wanted to see him. Now, it wasn't peaceful here. There were those who wanted King to come, those who said he didn't need to come, the locals could have it, and then some of the locals that said that their sponsors did not want King here. So it was a big, real mess. I know there was an NAACP meeting, and the person that was the NAACP attorney at the time, who was one of my mentors, the late Judge Otis Higgs, indicated that he had to jump under a desk because the Negroes pulled pistols on each other at that NAACP meeting over the issue of whether King was supposed to come or not. King was supposed to be staying at the Rivermark Hotel, which was the flagship for the Holiday Inn, but they moved him to the Lorraine Motel, which was a whorehouse. It was an hourly rate hotel. It was on the whole track. And it was rampant prostitution in there, and it was what it was. I know that because I knew the owner. And uh, matter of fact, I mean, this, I can't wait to see the comments. This brother, Ed, I mean, he's just going on and on and on and on. Like, so much like the interviewer is just I wish they could show his face too. One question. That's it. That's all he got in. 
himself and some other people had several meetings with him. He was going to sell the Lorraine, the Lorraine Motel, and it was my suggestion to make a museum out of it. And then A.W. Willis drew up the paperwork, and he was a damn good attorney, and he had been one of those who got some of the film that had to deal with Emmett Till's body down in Mississippi out of the state and to the governor of Illinois, along with a lawyer named Russell Sugarman. Both of them now dead. But anyway, A.W. finished up all the paperwork, got back to his office, and collapsed and died four days later. So here's what it is, but that's the story of the Lorraine Motel. The By the way, the Memphis Homicide Squad for MPD, Memphis Police Department, was adamant that Ray was not the gunman. Ray wasn't even in Memphis on the day in question. But the prosecutor's office was adamant that they were going to charge it. Now, they keep saying self-confessed killer of King. He denied it over and over and over again. And the judge in question, the late Preston Battle, who had the case before I did, said the ballistics tests were inadequate and ordered the rifle retested, but it never got tested. I ordered it retested. And when I had it retested, it was excluded from being a murder weapon. But we found out later that the FBI had been supplied with weapons that were identical in characteristic to what actually did kill King. So there you go. And J. Edgar Hoover, by the way, was a black man passing for white. If you ever see any early pictures of him, there's no question of what he is. And he, is his, he and his family got run out of Louisiana by the Klan for passing for white, and he hated the Klan for the rest of his life. Wow, we whoopee. That help? End the story. My brain is just... Let me look at some of these comments, man. Someone said, this is the truth, and he said it in a previous viral interview. All facts confirm what has been said for years. You can't just say end of story after saying J. Edgar Hoover was black. <laughs> Oh, man. Holy moly, the judge keeps drop, uh, dropping truth. Someone said, I listened to this with my eyes closed on accident and wow. Everybody's talking about J. Edgar Hoover being black. Hey, man. Again, I, I don't like to question anyone's truth, um, but that was a lot of information. I mean, the interviewer just let him just go, man. My mind is just kind of scrambling. Hey, um, yeah, appreciate you guys coming over. I can't wait to see the comments on this video. Uh, did y'all know all this? All right, peace out.